discover desireless desire. Today's message is the concluding message in the series on cultivating steadfast wisdom. It just seemed like, you know, so many of the teachings point to if you want to be wise, learn how to deal with desire, which can be an impediment to seeing clearly. Spiritual and religious teachings from many traditions caution the seeker against desire by declaring if you want access to peace, if you want access to wisdom and freedom, you have to free yourself from desire. So we have to say, is that even possible? And is it reasonable? Is it desirable? (laughs) Do we, what do we know about the power and presence of desire? I think just a little bit of investigation into our own mind, our own daily experience, we we can see that desires are pervasive, innumerable, persistent, insistent, and by the way, natural. The senses are naturally inclined toward their objects, which then stir desires in the mental field. And some desires, you know, are simply about basic survival needs, like you're thirsty, you desire water. But most of what we desire is beyond basic. And that's where the spiritual practice comes in, because the desires that are beyond basic, most of the time are part of the ego mechanism um, to prop up the sense of separate identity. So, I like this, I want that, (laughs) let me have it, it's mine or it's gonna be mine, all that desiring is props of the ego self. So, when we look at more deeply into the teachings about desire, What we find is that desire itself is not the problem. As I said, and we can observe, desire is natural. However, it's attachment and aversion that makes desire a problem. It's our clinging to what we want, our pushing away what we don't want that creates a sticky situation for us. So here's how it's beautifully described in chapter two of the Bhagavad Gita. I just want to read this passage to you today. And this is a translation of these verses 67 to 71 in chapter two by um, Eknat Ishwaran. He said, when you let, well, the Gita said, he translated, (laughs) when you let your mind follow the call of the senses, They carry away your better judgment as storms drive a boat off its charted course on the sea. Use all your power to free the senses from attachment and aversion alike and live in the full wisdom of the self. As rivers flow into the ocean but cannot make the vast ocean overflow, so flow the streams of the sense world into the sea of peace that is the sage. But this is not so with the desirer of desires. They are forever free who renounce all selfish desires and break away from the ego cage of I, me, and mine to be united with the Lord or the higher true self. So since, that's a tall order, isn't it? (laughs) When you look at this, so since desire is natural and connected at the core, you know, to life-supporting instincts, we can't eliminate it. We'd make ourselves crazy if we tried to do that. So how do we keep desire from running amok? 
and running off with our peace. The key teaching is in this verse that I just shared with you from the Gita. There's two points about that. The first one is renounce selfish desires is what the verse tells us. It doesn't say get rid of all desires. It says renounce selfish desires. Selfish meaning self-centered. It's about me. It's about mine. It's about what I want. It's about what we want that is concerned with profit or pleasure for ourselves alone that doesn't take into consideration how others might be impacted by what we want. And most of that, of course, most of those desires are about propping up that, that sense of you know, who we think we are from the ego perspective. One of my favorite poems by the mystic poet Kabir begins with this question. I said to the wanting creature inside me, what is this river you want to cross? I said to the wanting creature inside me, what is this river you want to cross? So when I notice incessant desires arising, I cite that poem to myself, and I ask myself some questions. The first one is, who or what is that wanting creature inside me? You know, you can hear it if you listen in, your own wanting creature that is saying, I want, I like, I need, <laughs> maybe I should. So I say to myself, who is that wanting creature? And then I say, hmm, what do I really want? Both those questions are enlightening around this thing of desire. The first question, who is that wanting creature, sends me back to my essential self, to my soul, nature that is already whole and complete. The soul is not a wanting creature. So you can bust that racket of the ego fairly easily by just asking who wants who, who is doing this wanting? Who's putting forth this agenda? And is this a good agenda? So that, that returns me to myself, to that capacity that I have to experience my own fullness, my own wholeness, and be freed from that incessant pull or push of desire. You know, the wanting creature wants all kinds of things. D don't send her online. <laughs> but the soul's not interested. So remembering who I am breaks that spell of desire. And then I can discover if there's something that I really do want or need that is appropriate or relevant. So I look under, you know, what is this top thing <laughs> that ego is, is trying to create? Is there anything really important under that? And sometimes there is. You know, sometimes it's something simple like, what I really want is um, some rest. What I really want is to connect with someone that I love. Those desires contribute to well-being and to my ability to be wise, to be clear, to be compassionate. So, you know, we can use our discernment there. Okay, so that first strategy is to inquire. The second strategy to keep desires from running rampant, running off with our soul's peace, is to cultivate the soul's peace on a regular basis, on a daily basis. Paramahansa Yogananda, you know, many of you are familiar with his chants. We were chanting one today, and he, he put together a book of cosmic chants, and he included in that book a Bengali, a translation of a Bengali chant that he noted was a favorite of his guru, Sri Yukteswar. 
And that chant is called, Desire My Great Enemy. <laughs> anyway, some of the words are, Desire My Great Enemy with his soldiers surrounding me is giving me lots of trouble, oh my Lord. Then he says, you know, in the spirit of Paramahansa Yogananda, he says, that enemy I will deceive. Remaining in my castle of peace, night and day in thy joy, oh my Lord. And then that's a beautiful refrain. Night and day in thy joy, oh my Lord. Night and day in thy joy, oh, oh my Lord. Night and day in thy joy, oh my Lord. So this is, I use this chant as a desire-busting strategy as well. And he goes further in this chant and um, brings in um, you know, his secret weapon, uh, which is pranayam, and, uh, and how that you know, changes the mind. And then part of the refrain uh, of the you know, night and day in thy joy, O my Lord, is you won't have to fear anything anymore. You won't have to fear anything anymore. Night and day in thy joy, oh my Lord. Night and day in thy joy, oh, oh my Lord. You won't have to fear anything anymore. You won't have to fear anything anymore. So, when we have cultivated a steady meditation practice, we can return to our castle of peace at will by turning our attention and awareness within. And sometimes if you have something, a mantra, or for me, I often use this chant as a, just a hook, but really all it is is a breath, you know, a moment of remembrance. That does it. And then, you know, remaining in our castle of peace, the fullness of divine remembrance changes our relationship with desire and allows our steadfast wisdom to come up to the surface and begin to help us discern what is really going on. And, you know, when we're in that spiritual fullness, fullness of love, completeness, wisdom, joy, we are not only free from egocentric desire, but then, and fear, um, but then when out of that fullness, we naturally begin to attract to us whatever it is we really need. This is what Paramahansa Yogananda called desireless desire. So if you can live in that fullness of yourself, you find yourself living in the flow of divine grace. And whatever is for you comes to you. So you meet the right people, and you're, as my guru described it, you're in the right place at the right time as opposed to being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So, and that comes from inside. You know, it's an internal adjustment. Um, and so, you know, we can notice that without striving or uh, pursuing things, they, they naturally unfold in graceful ways. So, the reason that wisdom traditions identify desire as an impediment to wisdom and compassion is primarily, as I mentioned, that it's a tool for propping up, for strengthening the ego self, which our spiritual traditions are trying to help us um, clear out, clear up. <laughs> so, but this mm, process of just letting desire run rampant not being aware of it so that it's controlling us whether, rather than the other way around, it not only 
um, props up the ego, but it blocks our access to intuition and to inner wisdom, inner soul guidance in the moment. So notice that desires are always about the future. They're about what we want, what we lack, or what we don't want. Um, but it's future-oriented. And the soul life, the soul-guided life, requires openness to the present moment, to being here now, open, receptive, to divine guidance, to divine grace, to love and wisdom being revealed to us. And it will reveal itself if we, if we show up for it. But if you're in that desiring mind, you're actually not here. You're in some imagined future, trying to attain something. So, you know, when we get too caught up in that, we, we literally miss our life, our real life, our soul life, what life is offering us. Amar and I watched uh, some TV show last week that had a very poignant scene in it that we were, you know, talking about after we turned off the show. It was a group of men uh, at a restaurant uh, late at night sitting around a table. And one by one, they were reflecting on moments in their life when they were so focused on what they wanted that they didn't see clearly what was right in front of them. And one man spoke about being so desirous of his son's success and wanting to support that, that he completely missed seeing and supporting his daughter's potential. That was painful, hearing that. And then another man spoke about how um, when his wife passed away, that he was sitting there, you know, sometime later in their apartment and looking around and all of a sudden, all he, he said, all I saw was only stuff. He said, I just saw things. And he talked about then how he and his wife had um, so thoughtfully invested their time, their money, their energy into everything they had selected for that home, that it was their life, it was their energy. But th at that moment, he saw only Things. He saw that it was just things and that at some point their children would be deciding what was worth keeping, giving, or even throwing away. And there, there was no problem about you know, desiring a lovely home. That wasn't the issue. But it was about the human tendency to become so involved in what we want that we can't fully see what we have. So steadfast wisdom is opening the eye of the heart, the ability to be receptive to love, to grace, to the reality, the truth of our being, and the beauty of the moment. Life unfolds continuously. And walking the spiritual path with steadfast wisdom and compassion is our ability to be awake and aware and receptive to that in every moment. I want to close with a cautionary tale <laughs> that uh, Robert Bly wrote in his um, book, um, Book of Poems. It was his introduction, The Soul is Here for Its Own Joy. It's an African traditional story. So once there was a man who raised a few cows he loved those cows and tended them and praised them every day for their beauty and for their generosity, for the milk that they gave to him. And then one day, 
he noticed that the amount of milk was less. And then each day, it became less and less. So he decided to stay up all night and go out on a watch and figure out what was going on. <laughs> so as he watched the cows and the night sky with all the stars, he saw a star that grew brighter and brighter as it came closer and closer to the earth. And when it landed in his cow pasture just a few feet from him, he could see that inside that ball of light was a luminous woman. And as soon as her feet touched the ground, the light disappeared and she stood before him as an ordinary woman. And he asked her, have you been stealing milk from my cows? And she said, well, yes, I have. My sisters and I really like the milk from your cows. And so he said, you're really beautiful. Will you marry me? <laughs> and then we can care for the cows together and you can have the milk. And she said, well, yes, I will. But there is one condition, and it is non-negotiable. I brought this basket with me, and you must never look into this basket, no matter what, no matter how long we are married, never. Never look into that basket. Do you agree to that? And he said, well, yes, of course. So they get married. They're doing really well. They're really happy. Everything is great. And one day, she's out tending to the cows, and he's in the house by himself. And he starts to reason. And he says, well, we're married now. And so... Actually, that basket is now my basket, too. And besides that, this is my house. And the basket is here, so I should be free to look in that basket. So he opens the basket, and he breaks out in astonished laughter, and he says, there's nothing in the basket. Nothing. Nothing in the basket, absolutely nothing. And he's laughing and laughing and laughing. And you know, about that time, she walks in. And she says to him, she opened the basket? And he says, yeah, I can't stop laughing. There's nothing in the basket, absolutely nothing in the basket. And she says, I'm leaving now. I have to go. And he says, no, wait. No, wait, no, don't, don't leave. And she says, I have to leave. I have to go back. She says, what was in the basket, what I brought with me was spirit. And it's so like human beings to think that spirit is nothing. So I close with that thought that spirit is all in all. Don't be fooled by desire. Come home to yourself, to your own divine fullness, and experience freedom from sorrow, experience the joy of the reality of what you are. Um.